Hi, thank you for tuning in to the Finding Harmony podcast with me, your host, Harmony Slater. Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Harmony, and I'm here with Rosa Case. Harmony. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Did You know, it's my birthday tomorrow. It is. Yeah, I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. You know, my, um, my niece called me this morning to say or texted me they you know yeah. the, how the kids are they text yeah. you text you wish me a happy birthday fabulous do you, do you i just thought maybe our listeners didn't know but i thought i think maybe you know you remember you know her full, full name yeah yeah do you, do, do you yeah what is it uh amelia something dwen gay <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's very close. It's Amelia Rose. She was named after like all of these uh, feminist heroes. Amelia Rose Duende. Duende. Do you remember what the, the Duende yes. is? Yes. What is the Duende? Uh, the climax in a sexual orgasm. No, in the flamenco. Oh. God damn. <laughs> Just, <laughs> so so rude. It's the isn't is it not the climax of the of the flamenco? And we have a flamenco dancer on the show today. <laughs> Hi, Delara. How are you? Delara. Delara. Hello. Delara. How are you, Delara? <laughs> Hello. Hello. That's Thank a true you. story. Yeah, I'm good. My brother refused to give her his name and then invented some other last name, last name for her. And now everyone thinks that she's uh, a Latina. Which is exciting for her. <laughs> for her. Yeah, many people think I'm Dolores, and then it's ah, Delara. Delara. Yeah. Delara. Yeah. Or Delara, yeah. as it was known in Canada. But you are not a Latina. No, no, I'm Iranian. Even though you practice the flamenca. <laughs> flamenco. Yes. Flamenco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're not Persian, <laughs> are you? Are you Iranian or are you yeah, Persian? She's... I would be, yeah, I, I often say I'm Persian, but yeah, the empire of the Persian empire became Iran and got divided to Tajikistan and different countries, but the race, it would be a Persian race, but from the country Iran. Is that quite a political thing to say? Are you in hot water now for saying that? Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. It's just uh because an afghani could be persian you know mm -hmm. and, yeah uh, mm -hmm. or some some places in in, in india you know there was a yeah. huge persian immigration after the conquest of islam and uh parts of um iraq there there are persians there and so it's a mix of jewish Sephardis and um uh, Persians and Arabs, so it kind of I think this distinguishes the race, and and then mm. you could be within a country, but you could be a Kurd or um, Azari. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. right. A little, there's maybe a little subtle difference. Yeah. But, but it's not a situation where growing up in Iran, that if you described yourself as Persian, people might um, be upset. No, and and there uh, we would say I'm I'm Iranian. Uh, we wouldn't refer to it as Persian, and I think, at least in in my experience, when I moved, uh, we my family moved to Canada, um, there was this confusion. At least in high school, many people thought um, I was from an Arabic country, and for us, that like kind of hurts us <laughs> it's like, no yeah. i'm not an arab i'm persian so then we right. start really distinguishing that i'm persian just to say yes oh, no i'm not from an arab country and iran is not an arab country and um and many people would think that uh i speak arabic and i was like no i speak farsi i'm persian but in, mm -hmm. in, in iran we didn't have the need to really reiterate that and make sure like people right. under, know that we're persian you know right, right. yeah right. Oh, amazing yeah. i i wanted to ask you if if um you're familiar with this uh graphic novel purse police by um, yeah, marjan yeah. Sakrapi. you know of it. course yeah oh yeah i i 
I really I fell in love with this with this graphic novel. I was a gold member at my comic book store, <laughs> and they would mm -hmm. pass on um, comic books to, to me that you know I wouldn't I wouldn't otherwise. And I just as I was going through it and reading about Marjan, you know, growing up in Iran and 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 living through the revolution in seventy nine, and you know her experience of having to to put on a headscarf where she hadn't had to before and all the different things like i remember um there's one particular page that really stuck with me where she had to run after the bus and mm -hmm. uh, a couple of police officers stopped her and said hey you can't be running like that because it makes your butt jiggle too much and yeah. she said, well, yeah, stop yeah. fucking looking, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're provoking. It's, it's, yeah. it's, who's provoking who? Like, you know, so it's, it, it's really like, it's, it's an amazing, um, it's an, it's amazing perspective that she has with that book because it really kind of, it, 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 it really underlines the, the issue is like of looking. And the male gaze, mm -hmm. and who is and who is trying to control the male gaze, and how do you how do you do that? It's like, well, you can you yeah. can you can put your girlfriend in, um, you can cover her up, and that controls the male gaze, or the 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 dude can just fucking stop it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and it's uh, mm -hmm. and you know, certainly like. Um, having spent my adult life in yoga rooms with scantily clad women, <laughs> you know, you just kind of get used to it and you stop looking like it's just not a big deal anymore. That is an interesting thing yeah. though. I mean, it really kind of like highlights the, the locus of control, right? Like, are you trying to control the world around you, which we all try to do in different ways at times, or do you realize that actually you are your own source of suffering and joy and torment yeah. and distraction and try to control the world within you which is really the essence yeah. of the entire yoga practice right yeah 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 but yeah that totally depends on how people are are grown up and what they're exposed to as well i mean it's a it's quite deep it goes to like a deep psychology level you know yeah. and uh, uh when uh when I, we were living in iran for example after the problem with talibans and afghanistan we have a lot of afghani refugees and um many afghanis would come to iran and they would be doing like really like, uh, labor work construction work and even as a kid you know i would be covered up but I had I was in the summer wearing sandals or a caprice pants maybe showing my ankle mm -hmm. and these men and you know I was like 10 11 they couldn't help it they would because in Afghanistan already by then all women were covered head to toe and even their eyes they have that um, right screen like you know and yeah. they couldn't help it they would see feet women's women's feet and they would just their gaze would just go like whoa like feet <laughs> so cool <laughs> you know it's just yeah, yeah you're like they're yeah, quite sexy these are just yeah. girls <laughs> feet right <laughs> yeah, but i mean for for someone yeah. who's just seeing feet all the time in sandals uh, it, yeah. I mean, it, there's nothing exciting about it right but if you've never seen feet or a forearm or neck, it's, yeah. it's, wow, it's incredible. So it's just, yeah. it's a hard topic to get into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It but it does also. On what they were exposed to. Yeah. Yeah. It does also kind of beg the question too. Is it, is it actually, um, controlling desire or fueling desire, right? Does, does yeah. the, repression yeah, yeah. fuel desire? Yeah. We, I experienced that growing up in the United States in the Midwest, <laughs> in what we call Baptist country, where mm. I think Abraham Lincoln said a Baptist is someone who who uh, who hears that someone is having a good time and wants to put a stop to it. <laughs> mm. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Good old Abraham Lincoln. He's a clever, clever fellow. <laughs> I, I, 
Let's let's talk about how no, what I don't want to change the subject. Oh, you Come. want to still keep putting race and religion. In Do you place? want to have a conversation? Because <laughs> I don't have to be here if you want to, hey. don't want to have a okay. conversation. <laughs> Go on. I wanted to ask you uh, on that topic. Uh, growing up in Iran, I I I wonder if um, you don't necessarily identify as. Uh, as uh, Muslim, I think you maybe you identify as as Sufi. I think your your parents are Sufi, mm-hmm. and I wonder mm-hmm. if you could talk about the differences between between that. Yeah, um, I mean, generally, many Sufi paths or have become interwoven with Islam. Um, however, the origin of uh, Sufism. It goes back to, you know, Mitraism and even before that, where they were schools of chivalrous behavior. Um, mm. And they, they call it um, Javon Mardi. It, it means like being noble, noble behavior and chivalrous behavior. And then after the attack of Islam, these schools uh, to survive because they, they would burn and just, you know, demolish anything that was not um, accepting Islam. Mm-hmm. They had to include, uh, you know, maybe put a sign of Allah in the Sufi house or uh, um, mm. and have prayers before um, uh, starting the reunion or like the, the Sufi reunion meeting uh they would pray you know kind of to just be like yeah guys like we submit <laughs> we're, we're doing we're praying to god and we're praising god and and they are but the definition of what god means in in islam shall we say you know and and uh sufis have uh, iranian sufis have another name for allah and then well after attack of islam then they would start you know um using the word Allah and the mantras would become Arabic, you know, and mm. these are, these were ways to survive under the Islamic rule. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then also within Islam, then many mystic paths emerged and there, shall we say, Sufi mystic paths of, of Islam. Um, mm. oh. But it, Interestingly, it doesn't, um, then it becomes kind of like tradition, you know, a Muslim growing up in a Muslim country might uh, do Ramadan, might go to Mecca for pilgrimage, uh, might Mm -hmm. continue with like uh, Islamic traditions, you know, or, or festivities. But then at the same time, for example, in Sufism, uh, we say God is everywhere. You don't need to pray towards Mecca. You don't pray mm. five times a day. You're remembering God with each inhale and exhale, not just five times a day. Um, yeah. Or the biggest pilgrimage is to walk away from your own ego. And yeah. um, that's the biggest uh, internal voyage. You don't need to geographically move from one destination to another. Um, so there are differences and usually, uh, Sufi masters who start questioning these, um, really super Islamic rituals, like, no, you should do this and you should do that. Then, um, the, the, then they start questioning Sufis of like, how dare you say that? You know, Mm -hmm. you don't need to pray towards Mecca. So it, it, it starts to cause some problems <laughs> and at least mm. um and then there's certain sufi paths that became totally sick, secular so the sufi path that um i was introduced to through my parents um the second last master really tried to make this secular as after the Re- revolution he was exiled in england his name is javad nurbach and he made this path um, open for, for everyone as a mystic path. So you can be Jewish, you can be Christian, 
or have no religion and practice Sufism, kind of like yoga as a, as a spiritual path. So it doesn't intervene with your beliefs and practice of another religion, or you don't have to practice any religion to, to practice Sufism. That's amazing. You, you described having, a, I, I think, quite a mystic experience quite early, and especially when, when you, you met uh, your Sufi master. I wonder if you could describe that. I'll try, <laughs> but we say uh, anything, anything that brings it towards belittles the experience. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. However, I knew I knew him obviously through my parents, and my parents were completely in love with him. You know, he had they had their pictures like beside their bedside, and my mom would, you know, yeah. read his poetry to me, and I was like, "Yeah, mom, like <laughs> that's great." <laughs> <laughs> when I was like 17, 18. And I actually would, you know, um, because then as a kid, I would, you know, have to go to the Sufi house uh, sometimes or there was dinner and my mom would say, there's no dinner at home. You got to come to the Sufi house for dinner. And, you know, I would see his pictures around the room and I kind of thought, you know, this guy, like, who, who does he think he is? Like, he puts his pictures around the wall. I mean, it's the disciples then put his pictures uh, mm. around right not not himself um so i i wasn't like so much into it to him but uh, i had this when i was um uh, 21 almost 22 i had a trip to morocco and uh i was with my boyfriend back then and um i was in a town named Esawira. And it was after all these years of being away from Iran, I, let's say after 10 years of having gone away from Iran, and I, had, I wasn't able to return to Iran after, um, it was like, wow, I would hear uh, the mosque, the prayer from the mosque 5 a.m. And back then when I was in Iran, I hated the, the prayer, every, anything to do with Islam, because we would create such resistance against yeah. Islam. But then when I was there, I was like, this is so beautiful. Like people are waking up at 5 a.m. to go to the mosque and pray. There was just like this beautiful um, feeling of like devotion and people. Um, I, I just saw a whole other side of Islam and people having faith and, and this beautiful devotion, like getting up at 5 a.m. to pray, you know. And um, it started awakening things in me and um then i i purchased this uh, sufi kawali flamenco cd and i was already dancing flamenco and it was like i'm pretty sure you know this uh song allahu 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 oh yeah sure Allahu. Uh, i don't know uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah. so i was like whoa like what's happening like now i'm <laughs> Something strange started awakening in me and I became sick. I started, uh, there was this calling that my parents' master was like, I, I need to go see him. I need to go see him. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And I told my boyfriend back then who we were supposed to travel for two weeks around Morocco. I'm sorry. Like, I think I need to go see this man. I can't continue traveling. And I was just crying and crying. And, wow. um, and I called back home and my master back then lived in uh, Oxfordshire in, in England. That's where he was exiled after mm -hmm. the revolution. And uh, back then there was like, you know, uh, very hard to Google things. And um, it's just like um, we're more arca archaic to get a hold of someone or like Google Sufi house London or, you know, <laughs> and I was calling back home and... <laughs> And I was like, mom, I, I really want to go see your master. And, and she was like, oh, no, Han, but you need permission. You need to, like, come to the Sufi house first and learn the rituals and stuff. You can't just go see the guy like this. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I need to go. Like, I'm, I can't. I'm going. Anyway, so they, yeah, they didn't allow me. And, and um, they and it's it was it's quite it was quite difficult to go see him. Also, because uh, he he's protected uh, because 
many spies or people would want to kill him, you know, so they wouldn't allow someone who doesn't already practice and they know their name and where they come from um, and that they're already a practitioner, just go to Oxfordshire to the orchard where he lived and to see him. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyways, that was my destiny. I had to go back home to Canada. I was uh, still living back home uh, in, in Vancouver. I uh, became you know, initiated as a, as a Sufi. And uh, a few months after I went to see him. And when I, when I went to his room, he opened his arm and he, as if he knew I was coming, it was just, it was Mm -hmm. like, we're like, I just went and hugged him straight. (laughs) And um, he was already quite old. And I, um, so it's, there is no logic behind it. It's really like as if you're destined, it's by the grace of God that you yeah. get into it. There's no rational um, decision making saying like, yeah, he seems like a nice guy and I like I like his writing. <laughs> <laughs> like there was no rational uh, decision making, but just really falling in love. Yeah. And it was after falling in love that I started really reading his poetry and books um, because even to become initiated, everyone was like, no, but you, you should read Sufi um, principles and, <laughs> you know, all these books and see yeah. if you actually like, them. like, I, no, I don't like, I don't need this. I, I, I'm in. And then actually when I read the books, there were things that I would disagree with, you know, I was like, no, but, no, I don't think devotion should be like this or, you know, kind of like as if you read yamas and yamas and they don't yeah. make sense to you. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, but there was so much uh, connection and love with him that all the writings and, you know, yeah. uh, logistics wouldn't matter. It, it, it was just like completely kind of destroyed in a good way, shattered by him. Wow. That's- wow. I mean, yeah. that's mystic is a it's a mystery that's, that's <laughs> yeah. really what it is i you it describe is, yeah. you describe the experiences as walking around uh in a state of drunkenness <laughs> yeah it, 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 it i was blown away and and it took me years to recover because i i was like drunk for some years i couldn't socialize anymore with my friends and i would just like put on sufi music and like, <laughs> sufi drumming and wow. uh, i would only be able to go to like sufi gatherings playing music for, with people and people who knew the master and it was really hard to make sense of it and and mm-hmm. integrate it into my normal life mm-hmm. um and people who I was in connection with uh, before and kind of understand that not everyone is into what you do. Not everyone is, <laughs> you know, drunk like you and, <laughs> and, and that I should still be able to connect with them. And, and um, yeah. To, I, I yes. wanted to ask about that word in particular, because one of the things that struck me about the, about Rumi's poetry is the the number of times that he refers to the state of drunkenness as a kind of ecstasy, and I've mm. I had not seen that. It's a very common Sufi metaphor, not really in any other religion. In so exactly, much. and I and I'm it's mystifying yeah. to me that it's not in any other kind of uh, space, but it is there, and it is kind of so yeah. appropriate, but. It, yeah, As a it's... Baptist, grow, growing up in Baptist country, it's entirely inappropriate. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because the metaphor of uh, the God or the Sufi master being the cup bearer and pouring wine in your cup is, and, and, and the disciple is thirsty for wine, like begging for wine, um, is usually often... Um, used as a metaphor in Sufi poetry and actually many po- more, many poems are censored uh, after the revolution in the, mm-hmm. sure. uh, I believe um, it yeah, yeah because they're like oh <laughs> these like Sufis are always drunk and, yeah. and I mean and, and the Sufi house is and called a tavern 
a tavern. Yeah, yeah. Really? It's called, the Supi House is tavern, called a tavern. tavern. <gasps> yeah, wow. a tavern of love. And it means that's where you get to get wine. And, yeah. and, uh, and wine in the meaning of, I don't know, grace, um, attention yeah. of the beloved. Oh. And, uh, and this, this state of thirst, you know, because then sometimes, uh, the beloved gives you wine and sometimes shatters your cup. But, uh, they say that the disciple has to be, uh, in equanimity, uh, that, that mm-hmm. the rejection of the master or God is as equal as, um, it's praise or, or mm-hmm. pouring wine. So. So that was the hard one. <laughs> it's practice. so beautiful. <laughs> oh, it's just gorgeous. It's such a beautiful metaphor. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you just one more question about this state of being. Um, I didn't start drinking <laughs> until my forties. I had never. I didn't really drink until then, and um, I, I'm having a, an experience that. Um, has been ecstatic and surprising. <laughs> and I just wanted to ask you if this, if they, if they write about this, um, you know how you get the, this, I don't know if you've ever drunk, but I, I, if you get these spins when you drink and the room starts to spin. And so mm-hmm. I'll find myself kind of like maybe uh, just lying in bed with the room spinning. And then it comes to a, like a flamenco, like a duende, it comes <laughs> to the it comes to a climax of spinning. The vibration becomes faster and faster and faster, and then it releases into, and I feel myself falling down a rabbit hole, and I am released into an ecstatic moment that is like a, like really an orgasm, but is kind of more like a psychogasm. Yes. And then it's quite amazing, but I don't hear anyone talking or writing about this in our culture at all. We're, oh yeah, yeah, I had my ecstatic experience on 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 champagne last night. What? Was, <laughs> no champagne. one ever talks about that, and so I'm wondering if if this is what you're describing reminds me of like the Sufi uh, mystics, like going in circles, swirling, swirling. dervishes, yeah. yeah, and I'm mm-hmm. and I feel like. I could create like a cult around this experience. Like you get enough women drunk and we just all yeah. lie down in a room and we, we, <laughs> we, no, yeah. you, 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 you spin, like, yeah, um, like go dive deeply consciously into your spins. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I maybe I'm just, what's that disease the young, young men get when they go crazy? The, um, Schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say vertigo. But it's like, it's, it's extremely predictable. If I Sounds have like enough vertigo. to drink and I'm left alone, I'll lie down and it'll happen every time. Yeah. I mean, there is a, there is a link between them. Duende, sure. Samadhi, Fana, you know. And and Duende is um, you know Garcia Lorca would use that the poet word Duende yeah, yeah. and uh, Duende also means magic and oh. um, means magic and and I think uh, that that state that you know when you see art and like you get goosebumps and it's just like no words for it and or like a singer strikes a note or you know or the pianist or whatever musician there's that that magic and that there's no word for it and um and that's that's for example in flamenco that's when they use uh like someone has duende means they've got the that special magic magic that is hard to describe in words it just you just get goosebumps and and Mm -hmm it uh, strikes you in the heart, you know? It's not like technically virtuous or perfect. It's just like uh, the voice just reaches something so deep within you and takes you into an experience as you're describing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the spinning. The whirling. The, spinning. the whirling. Yeah. 
Maybe we need to explore Sufism a bit more. I think we could. Yeah. You, um, you see a lot of yeah. that in the um, psychology circles of California. They they all have a kind of Sufi background. What I find so interesting about mm. um, your description of it is, um, you know, doing a degree in religious studies, everything has its little place. <laughs> <laughs> in his, mm-hmm. his little box that you're putting it in <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and it's beautiful to hear you describe it because it's like taking it out of the box and and seeing how you know because in um you know when you're studying religion it's sort of like well this is a, a sufism is a combination of islam and hinduism and it's like mm-hmm. taking sort of things from these different religions and and maybe a little bit of Zoroastrianism, but it's sort of like taking yeah. all these different things and like, and then Sufism is born. Um, mm-hmm. And and it's beautiful to kind of hear you describe it because um, what comes to me is that it it is it's it's not like taking all these things as described in like a religious studies context, right? Where they're trying to make sense of something or looking at it objectively, it really brings it to life and, and that it has its own history and richness and tradition that's not um, borrowed in a way or like Mm -hmm. um, pieced together, which was always, a bit more of how it was explained or described from like a academic kind of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like religion can get complicated, you know, like you have to do this in order to reach a certain level and you have Mm -hmm. to behave like that and live like this and that's wrong and that's right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Sufism is just really simple to say but hard hard to do and it's saying okay you know do do whatever you want but (laughs) sufism is about being nothing being Mm -hmm. nothing and how you get to become nothing is by loving and serving uh god or the the man every manifestation of god so in other words other mm, living beings right and uh, so through that, through serving and loving, you forget, we forget our own ego and therefore become nothing. And that's how the union with, uh, with God or union with your Purusha happens. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then it's like, well, and then do all your religious traditions and, you know, whatever you want to do. But that, that's just the main message. I love that. What was the what was the uh, Persian word for God? Or Samadhi? Uh, we either who, who, yeah, who? because uh, we have Haq also. Haq means truth, but Haq is an Arabic word again. But the yeah. Farsi word is who, yeah. Who? There's a amazing. There's a book in in my. Uh, home state of Louisiana that was famously banned when I was in, in, in high school. Voodoo hoodoo. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's, that's song. Yeah, who does? Oh, I know. It's does, in the Labyrinth song, but it, with uh, David Bowie. Oh. The voodoo hoodoo. Oh. Who does voodoo? <laughs> who does? <laughs> who does? God does. Excellent. Yeah. That's nice. It's interesting because it also um, it also makes me think about um, that that word, like the question. I forget in Sanskrit, um, ka, right? Oh, Mm. that's a a great book. Yeah, but I think it means like what, right? Yeah. What? Yeah, and it's sort of the, it's also the first syllable of the Sanskrit alphabet. Mm. And then also kind of is a um, representation of like this ultimate reality, right? Which is like what? Infinite, yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Infinite what? It can only kind of be expressed. And so, I mean, just because of English, who is like a question, right? It's like who? (laughs) And so again, it it sort of is like this beautiful kind of um, like 
mystery. Koan, right? Mm, Third right. person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're just mm-hmm. like left in that emptiness, actually, in that state that you were talking yeah. about, like without an answer. <laughs> yeah. Silence, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. The void. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. a one there's a, a lovely Koan um in Zen. Um my um the nun tried to describe her i'm gonna have to i'm gonna do it differently because it's too it's too bad a a, a monk um a female nun was uh heard a you gotta stop barking a female nun uh uh heard a monk describing his mystical experience and so she punched him in the face Mm-hmm. We're yeah. It's. <laughs> I mean, it's advised to not uh, not uh, talk about our mystical states. Yeah, yeah. It as because, you say, yeah, it does. It belittles it, them. It belittles, and it's just so hard to bring it uh, into words, right? Yeah. It's just it doesn't do justice. I mean, we could say the events that happened, just like, as I say, you know, I did this and then and I went there and I met him. But then the experience of like being in his presence mm. and how would you describe being in the presence of ocean? And I don't oh, know, it's just, it, no, I, there are no words for it. It was so beautiful. Um, so yeah. this was your early journey into like yeah. a deep dive into your spiritual path and practice. Yeah. And it's yeah. lovely that it also ties into your your family traditions as well. I, but it is mm. it's inter- curious, curious, like how, why are you not a Sufi nun? <laughs> how did you just then, like you're calling us from a yoga studio in Switzerland. Like that's quite a divergent journey. Like, you said, and then I got into Ashtanga yoga. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Did you did you know that Richard Freeman was teaching the Shah in Iran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in yeah, 1979, yeah, yeah. and yeah. got kicked out of the country. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's amazing. Like, there is this foothold of Ashtanga yoga there, and you're you're a part of that history now. How did that happen for yeah. you? How did I got out of Iran? Well, that's a good oh, question no, too. No, yeah, no, you, I mean, I've been to Canada question. with your family. Oh, how did but, I? Yeah, well, how no, did you but do like Ashtanga you're, yoga? No, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a spiritual drunkard. Yeah, and then <laughs> one day ah, I'm a shangi now. Well, it's it's both. They're all the same thing, you know. Yeah. You know, I don't want to like compare, but I think. Um, one one complements the other, which is so interesting. You know, I have to say, um, when when I was uh, meditating or s- sitting in a Sufi reunion, it, it would it was sometimes really hard. It was really hard to sit for an hour. You know, everyone's like doing their meditation, and, and my leg would fall asleep, and there would be like ants, pins and needles in my leg, and I was like. Oh. Um, kind of ecstasy <laughs> then I would get up well. and just like limp <laughs> and, and I would be fidgeting and um, there was a lot of crying I would cry a lot in, in mm-hmm. Sufi reunions and um, yeah. especially in the beginning and you know then after many, I mean, I say many years but at least six good six seven years of uh asana practice and then starting pranayama i realized that my sitting meditation in the sufi house changed a lot or just like sitting sitting meditation and i think um this this hatha yoga method that prepares the vessel for the higher limbs is so necessary, at least in my experience. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know because I've seen other Sufis like who who've been practicing for many years. Like an old man just like sits there for two hours and nothing <laughs> happens to him. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he doesn't fidget. He doesn't move. But you know, as a young girl, I was like, okay, I sit there a little and then move a little. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then my legs would fall asleep and mind chatter would start. And as much as I would start, uh, try to stay with the mantra, inner mantra with each inhale and exhale, it was difficult. But mm-hmm. then with years of asana and pranayama, I was just way more at ease and able to, to sit without fidgeting and my legs falling asleep. And um, as if also somehow the vessel, whatever was it, it was carrying the trauma, the pain, the sadness, whatever it was stored that would come out as tears during meditation. I was, I was much more at ease and um, as if like some, something was cleansed out of my system. And it, and it could, and also being able to integrate that, you know, that high voltage I was telling you in the first years after seeing the master and oh, all these feelings and energies at the Sufi house, it was just so overwhelming, like for my system, it was so hard to make sense of it, of this connection um, with, with God, or maybe little experiences of Samadhi, it was just so overwhelming Mm -hmm. whereas um practicing and preparing the vessel is it's kind of like yeah i'm witnessing or i i can make sense of this and how am i gonna apply what i'm experiencing into my into my life instead of being a weirdo who can't connect with others hey how can i like um connect with people and love them and accept them as the way they are and find some kind of something that connects us and how can I serve them? How can I uh, apply the teachings into the society instead of being a hermit and, and you know, <laughs> just being well, a drunk card in my room. <laughs> but how do you, I, I just want to ask about the, the, the pivot in the moment you decided to pivot, because at one point you were, you're sitting there realizing that you can't socialize. You, it's hard to relate to people that don't know this feeling, this love. And I think Harmony and I understand you. Mm. To then, maybe I'll just do a yoga class. <laughs> how does the idea form? How do you how do you allow yourself? How how does that that young girl who's who is uh, now uh, militantly in a new uh, cult, then say, well, I'll just try this other one out. I'll try this other cult out. (laughs) (laughs) Who told you that was okay? Yeah, I mean, I start. I got into um, the asana practice. <laughs> so it was like, oh, well, I've got my spiritual guide and life. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm, I, I started doing yoga because of asana, and it just, it, it felt like I, I didn't even know about yama vinyamas or like nothing. You know, like what, yeah. yo- what yoga, the philosophy behind yoga is about. And it was, uh, I got into yoga, uh, Ashtanga, through my brother, which I can elaborate la- later. And uh, I, I walked into, and he was like, you should you should start Ashtanga. You should stop fooling around, going to vinyasa classes, and this and that. <laughs> I was like, right. okay, I'll try it out. <laughs> and I was, you know, I had done martial arts. I was dancing. And I went into an Ashtanga school and like, yeah, kind of my ego was hurt. I was like, geez, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm dying just doing like three Surya Namaskars. And, and I, I was so impressed. And people were just doing primary series around me. Nothing like crazy second or anything. Mm, but yeah. just seeing someone doing Garba Pindasana or yeah. Shrutta Kurmasana. It's like, it's like what? And and the sound of the breath and and doing the asana practice, um, I was very stiff uh, actually because of flamenco dancing. My legs were very like tight muscle, yeah. and it uh, you just by prasadita, right? Yeah, high heels yeah. and a lot of footwork and impact yeah. to the lower back and hips. Yeah, so. In Prasarita Padottanasana, I couldn't do the four positions one after another. I, I had to like come out, shake my legs because it was yeah. just burning. Yeah. And then I would see these like 
people much older than me, like was 23 back then, like in their 40s and 50s, you know, with their legs behind their head. <laughs> and I thought, mm, there's something wrong with me. Like I should, I should be able to do this. And so I got hooked through the asana practice. And back then, I remember the only thing, I've, and this was in Spain, so the the bookstores didn't have much uh, yoga books, especially in English. But the studio had uh, Gregor Mailer's uh, primary series book in the reception. Mm -hmm. And this is how, like, I was, like, looking at it. And the beginning of the book has the yamas, niyamas, and the sutras. It all seemed like, whoa, like, this is just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's going on? Guess, but, but, yeah, but then I was like, oh, there's, like, a... There's a there's deep a part into this. There's a thing. Yeah. And this was we, with Bo yeah. Borja in his oh, in his Borja? role show, yeah. right? Borja, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. fantastic! Yeah, Beautiful. oh, he's such yeah. a lovely dude, Borja. Very humble guy. Yeah, yeah, and and so sweet. Your so brother sweet. Arvand, yeah. he took you, mm -hmm. and Arvand yeah. is famously Harmony's <laughs> stu yoga student. Yeah, we have such a funny <laughs> yeah. connection, like across the globe yes. connection. <laughs> well, how yeah. did this happen? What's going so, on here? Yeah, so we could say that it's Harmony's fault that I found this. <laughs> Look at you in Switzerland teaching yoga. It's because of Harmony. Yeah. <laughs> Your brother was doing a lot so, of vinyasa style in Vancouver, and then he moved to Victoria for school, right? Yeah, he was going to uh, UVic, and he yeah. was. I, I tried to ask him the details so that I, I know I know the background a little. <laughs> and he told me that he was going to this uh, place called M Moksana Moksha. or Mokshana. Yeah, or Moksha. Uh, yeah, it was like vinyasa style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, and he said it, it was in Fountain Alley, and uh, yeah. Jeff McKenzie was yeah. teaching there, like half primary guided. Yeah. And he was uh, practicing with him and probably Jeff was away, probably maybe in Mysore. And there was another girl who was your student, Harmony, Darcy. Darcy. Who was, I subbing, Darcy who was subbing Jeff. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> apparently you and uh, your ex-partner had come back from Mysore recently. Yeah. And Darcy had asked you to come and, you know, just teach like one class at that Mokshana studio yeah yeah and my brother said that just hearing you chant he was like okay like this is different <laughs> there's something up here and then he was like yeah and then the way she was moving around the room adjusting people and we She's were quite like, not used to this at all <laughs> <laughs> but he was so impressed and then um, maybe a few months after, uh, he, because he, Darcy was going to this place, this Tibetan monastery. Yeah, was it was, a, it was a, we were teaching in a, like a, a Tibetan meditation center. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, so he started coming there little by yeah. little. And he, he told me that he was so before walking into the room, he would feel kind of intimidated because he thought he's going somewhere really hardcore, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, just hearing them breathe. It was like, <laughs> it was scary. And yeah. people were doing advanced asanas. But it, so it was hard for him uh, to go, but something was telling him yeah. to go and practice. Yeah. which I think I completely relate to starting Ashtanga yoga. It's, it's yeah, and then he impressive. like, he, he got so into it and he even went to Mysore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I saw him there. You saw Ravan. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And um, he moved to San Francisco for his job and That's he right. um, started oh, really? to practice as Magnolia yeah. there. I remember. Oh, see, your twin, Monica, she was practicing with Magnolia. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to introduce you, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so then he said to you, he was visiting you in Spain and said, we're going to this yoga class, you're coming? 
you know what? No, no, no. I, I, bet, was, yeah. I bet Arvand knows Monica. I, he would have met another girl from Iran and said, oh, hi. Probably. I, yeah. Yeah. I'll bet you a hundred bucks. I'll, I'll <laughs> ask him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, but back then, uh, he was still in Victoria and I had moved to Madrid to pursue flamenco. Uh -huh. And uh, he kept saying, and by then I was, you know, going at you I, I was going to ubc and there you know one day there was hatha class and then one day vinyasa right. and i didn't even yes. know what style is what i was just yeah. like okay i'm gonna move and i would pay a drop in and go to class and um <laughs> uh and but then he was like no no you you should try ashtanga yoga and go to a maestro class look for it in madrid and i was like yeah yeah okay whatever you always think you know better and <laughs> He's five years older than me. And uh, I was just randomly walking around my neighborhood and Borja had this little sign, very small, uh, <laughs> on the rails of, of his window saying Ashtanga Yoga Madrid. <laughs> and oh I was like, oh, this is what my brother is talking about. And I just went in and got information and I started wow. it and I was dying. <laughs> and I was dying. And I was dying. And then... Sure. Then I died. And then you ended up in Mysore, India. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. You went down the rabbit hole. And and so yeah. I know you studied with Rolf in Goa, and that's where you started learning some pranayama. But then mm -hmm. you also got into Rolf and Rolfing, which is a <laughs> different type of Rolf. Yes. I got into yeah. Rolfing. I don't do Rolfing, but I got into Rolfing uh, through Mitchell Gold, who maybe oh, you know Mitchell and Kirsten. Yeah, I do. I do know them, but I uh, I never got sessions from from Mitchell. I mm. got into it because of Ken. Oh, uh, Ken the Rolfer. Ken from... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ken's great. Yeah. Did friend. you meet him in Goa? Yeah. No, I met him in Mysore, in Mysore. Yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, and by session three, I was like, "Can how can I? Where do I study this? How can I? How yeah. can I start doing this?" Yeah, so it was There's incredible. Nothing quite as amazing as having someone's whole arm up your nostril. <laughs> it's sort of something transformative about it. Like, oh. It's true. When I saw his <laughs> little finger, I was like, "You really gonna put that in my nose?" <laughs> With this little yeah, yeah, pinky condom, fine. yeah, <laughs> like in the olive oil. I was like, "Oh, that's that's not going to work. It's not going to work at all." I did the yeah. I did like eighteen sessions with with Mitchell. Wow! And um, loved it. I thought it was amazing. It it transformed my body. <clears throat> I was I had quite a a sunken chest, and it was very tightly bound mm. and wound up. And I ne always breathed into my breathed in my belly, but now like my whole midsection is so full and open, and like I have pecs which I never had yeah. growing up. And, yeah, like, it's it's really it was it just absolutely transformative. And I I remember yeah. Mitchell saying once like I've worked on you hard for years and never seen you whimper, <laughs> and then one time I worked on your calf and you shrieked. And it's, yeah. it's like, yeah, my I don't touch my calves, you know. And it's like, <laughs> please. And it's funny that the body is a really funny thing. I wonder if you can talk to us at all about your fascination with in a structural integration and Ida Rolf yeah. and the whole thing. What is it about you that that took you? So I was um, already in my I think I was thirty and and. Uh, I was already suffering a lot with hip pain. I was still dancing. And uh, that's when I was in in Mysore and discovered Ken. And I had tried everything, osteopathy Bet. and... Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, but how I, I discovered rolfing through Ken in Mysore. And when... I had tried like sports therapy, physiotherapy, dry needling. And <clears throat> when I took a session with, with uh, Ken and I told him how I have hip pain and I can't sleep at night, it's always like just pounding uh, pain. 
Uh, <laughs> that sounds uh, exactly he, like the pain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he started working on my arms, uh, like uh. really excruciatingly deep into my yeah. forearm. Uh, both the inner side and the outside. And I was like, uh, I don't know if this guy got it right. Like, I have hip pain. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know why, yeah. why you're working on my arms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like really meticulously, you know, going yeah. very deep into the forearm and asking me for hand movements. Like, okay. And um, <clears throat> this is when I saw, well, okay, this, this guy is not, can see way bigger than where you have the local pain. And mm -hmm. so when I, for the first session, when I got up uh, off the roofing table or bed, I had never felt my arms swing so freely by my side. Uh -huh. And I, and I realized that because of dancing, you know, flamenco, you use a lot of your hands, yeah. castanets, and also you're always controlled. You know, I was taking also ballet, mm -hmm. so you never like dangle your arms be beside you. you. Never walk on right. stage just you know, <laughs> yeah, dangling the arms <laughs> beside. It's always controlled, and there's a position, yeah. and there's yeah. always you know a gesture. And yeah. so then you go out of you, the re rehearsal or dance class, and you're always controlled. And yeah. I realized that there's no. Um, and, and so the, the energy is being stored somewhere in the body without, you know, in a spiral way um, exiting the body. So with each step, the shock of each step has to get out of the body in, the, in a spiral way. And if it's stored in the body, it can, you know, manifest itself in the knee or hip or, you know, shoulder. It's different right. for each person. And um, just having that freedom of walking it was already you know changing things mm. um and uh, how I was breathing how I was my idea of stability in my core how I was always having you know squeezing the bellies in because that's how your dance teacher always says you know you're even sleeping with your abdomen engaged <laughs> yeah and so my diaphragm was always hard not yeah. not free yeah. yeah. And um, so, yeah, then, then I saw, wow, you know, the, it's my pain is manifesting itself in the hip, whereas I'm not breathing correctly. My ankles are stiff. My arms are not free. And the energy is being stored in, in the hip. And so it's not, there's no spiral movement in the body. And that's, and I thought, I found that so uh, fascinating. The, the way a, a Rolfer or how Ida Rolf looked at a body and how it functions instead of going, uh, like focusing on where the pain is and mm -hmm. instead looking at the body in a global way and, and in gravity because many therapists just lie you down and work on you um, lying down, but then yeah. you're functioning upright in gravity and moving. Mm -hmm. So then how do you integrate that manipulation you did on the table into a moving body in gravity? Right. So that, the, yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> I wonder if you could, but, um, speaking of the hip, I wonder if you could talk about the psoas because Ida was like some kind of magician with the, the psoas. You know, she would like, I, I'd heard stories that she could, use her psoas oh, and her well. leg to, you know, yeah. to throw things across the room with her <laughs> leg because she was she was oh, wow. such a dynamic she had such dynamic mastery of her own body yeah um, so us uh, well yeah because um the the way she sees uh the psoas or the like an umbrella so if the umbrella is the diaphragm the psoas and the kuros of the diaphragm mesh into the psoas. So the psoas kind of becomes the stick or the leg of the umbrella. So, and the, the diaphragm and psoas can affect one another or, you know, vice versa. So if the diaphragm is spasm, the, the psoas has a different tonus or vice versa. If we, if we lock the psoas short or too long, then it, it, it affects how we breathe. Mm. So um, 
And if the psoas become the leg, uh, she has this saying, for example, walking, meeting, breathing. So the way you walk and how your legs swing and how you use your legs affects the umbrella, the, the diaphragm, or vice wow. versa, how you breathe will affect how you swing the legs. <laughs> So it was wow. just, I mean, and this woman, we're talking about 1920s, you know, yeah. Ida Wolf is like the same era as Einstein and Feldenkrais, Tesla. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. amazing how, how she was already seeing these things, these connections yeah. uh, at, that, at that age and the fascia. No one was talking about fascia no. as a organ of form. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's such a beautiful point because I mean, now people think, oh, mind body connection and we store emotions in our body and fascia like transmit messages from like your big toe to the top of your head. Or, you know, we have these sort of ideas in our culture. It's, you mm -hmm. know, not like <laughs> as, as like, challenge like they're not challenging ideas for us because we've integrated yeah. this knowledge into our understanding of the world but in 1920 that's like mm -hmm. totally out there yeah. nobody's talking about yeah. mind body connection no, nobody's talking no. about the communication of the body or emotions stored in the body or the movement duality. of the body and how we breathe and and it all being integrated it's that's yeah. incredible yeah and she was doing hatha yoga Ida rolf was a hatha yogi and Amazing. and it's so interesting that when you read uh, her book you're like whoa she's talking about mula banda or this is udhyana yeah. banda what she's talking yeah. about with the connection of the bandhas and wow. and there's so much connection and parallelism with this hatha yoga that uh that you can tell that she's being in inspired by by yoga yeah. also does it I was uh, maybe I'm kind of going too off into the the fairies here, but I, I, in in weightlifting you see this a lot. This use of the bundas because they have to kind of pull themselves up into their chest and really lift up, and they have to really pull in and suck in. and And with some of these early yogis, you you see um, a relationship between weightlifting and and yoga because of their use of of bunda. And I, mm -hmm. I think about it all the time. And I look around uh, at athletes, like I'll look at, like I was watching Steph Curry last night play basketball or mm -hmm. different athletes. And they're so hunched over and curled in and a panic and they can't, mm -hmm. and I look at them and I was like, you can't breathe. You're too round and you're like a turtle. You're so round. Interesting. And mm -hmm. I think about how culturally different sorts of bodies be are popular based on on a particular kind of um self-belief and so it seems like we're in a very aponic digestive rounded time where everyone is curling their body looking for like sharp abdomens you know sharp abdominal muscles whereas in the mm. 20s and 30s like you look at like superman on tv and black and white and clark kent you know, chest, yeah, yeah. Chest, and he's also he's so like heroic. His body is so open and full. He, I'm Superman. I'm here to save the day. Yeah, you know? yeah, and he's open yeah. and he can sing. You know, and it's very, yeah. it's a very, it's a, uh, it's amazing how these patterns are are so deeply held in the body that it also permeates culture. Absolutely. And, and Ida Rolf does talk about it, how your psychobiological being and how your background and culture affects um, your body. So like uh, rolfing in Japan would be completely different than rolfing in Spain or um, mm -hmm. the States. For example, Spain, all women are like, hey, ¿qué pasa? you know, like the chest is pumped up. <laughs> 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 it's like... Uh, and they're very extrovert and, you know, all, yeah. you know very out there. That's and then it. there are certain cultures that are, you need to encourage coming out. Or as you're saying, you know, yeah. being like a you know, basketball player is a totally different um, way of carrying oneself than yeah. a, a baller ballerina. For example, um, for me, it because I was coming from this flamenco background, it was always, you know, 
the chest up. This this was like the posture with with the um, it's a bit of extension of the thorax, and mm. that was creating a lot of problems for my mid back because I was always uh, engaging the, the back muscles to have this uplifted chest. And actually, the ribs never had a chance to exhale and relax. Yeah. So it was kind of like being fixated in an inhalation pattern. Mm. And it took me years to be able to, uh, like 25 rolling sessions probably, to <laughs> release the chest and, and also um, psychologically feel okay with that. Because for me to exhale and relax the chest felt like, I've, I perceived myself as I'm hunching over and I'm being a panic, whereas yeah. you would look at yourself in the mirror and be like, no, actually that's okay. It's just my perception. Yeah. But because of being so up here, <laughs> yeah. uh, relaxing the chest felt like I'm collapsing. So it's so interwoven with, yeah. um, with our psychology and culture and environment we yeah. grow up. What's so mm -hmm. interesting, did you have this experience when you were learning Ashtanga and you got to Garbha Pindasana and it was like a board, like just going, <laughs> like you couldn't even do it. You couldn't no. roll. You're like, how do you people roll? You cannot in this? For me, Yeah, because there's no. no rounding, right? No, I was Your just like just a... like yeah, stuck yeah. totally straight and you're like, bang, bang. No, bang, I was bang. just like a tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> It took me so yeah. long to do Garba Pindasana because it was the same, yeah. like stuck in that like inhale pattern and like that upper thoracic like opening, mm -hmm. like yeah. this rounding, like uh, Baddha Konasana B was impossible. Yeah. A, no problem. B, yeah. Yeah. not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was that no, same rounding sure. action is as... Um, you need to do the rolling in Garba Pindasana. And it, I don't think it was actually even until I had completed second series and had been doing that for a long, long time. And even mm -hmm. into third series, the beginning part of third series into the arm balances where you really have to get that need to be strong, yeah. uponic yeah. kind of pushing but well, that's that's how it, you do it changed my spine. That's how you do a handstand Absolutely. from sitting is you have to all to have to completely round into yeah, a tennis ball. I can't ball. do it. You have to. You I have still to, yeah. to this day, that's like not yeah. an action that's super yeah. Yeah, yeah, normal. Yeah. <laughs> but it was actually, oh, I mean, comparatively sure. quite easy for me. Yeah, because you were already rounded. Because I was already hiding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's funny, isn't it? How these different patterns yeah. you can see them also playing out in the asanas and 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 I, that's the one thing i love about the ashtanga sequence is it really does hit all those areas like whether yeah. you have a rounding pattern you're going to get challenged in other ways right if you have this open Absolutely. like pranic pattern you get challenged in the aponic you know in the other ways and it's Balancing you just can't hide Absolutely. yeah <laughs> it yeah. catches all yeah, yeah, the yeah. areas yeah <laughs> Yeah, And it does change us as a person too, because mm. I was always so, you know, in the, when with the chest open, it was like yeah. always projecting towards the future, uh, yeah. ambitious and uh, uh, really out there um, yeah. and resting the chest and resting the heart within the chest brought me more within myself. I became mm. more introvert, calmer, mm. slower than, you know, it just it changed me completely as a as a person also this yeah. this um, changing of uh, posture yeah, yeah i remember uh, i have a, a you're in switzerland i have a, a swiss friend michael what's michael's last name very handsome man um michael uh i know who you're thinking of yeah uh steve and thomas is working for him or married his best friend something like that and michael i remember seeing michael um in mysore one one day and he was reading a book and he was just breathing michael, yeah oh, he south african oh he's south mm -hmm. african he's yeah south in african. switzerland yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah he was living in uh, zurich i got in touch with him uh, a few times because he was in zurich and then he was in munich where i was studying rolfing oh, but right. he never 
coincided. He I oh. think he's moved to Venezuela now or oh. married to a Venezuelan girl, oh. I think. Oh, I you're know. thinking she's thinking of Michael uh, Shorebert. Oh, I'm not thinking that of Michael. You're Shorbert. thinking of Michael uh, Hamilton. I'm thinking of Michael Hamilton. Also, oh, sorry, he's okay. South African. Maybe uh, so, <laughs> but living in Spain. Okay. Um, so Michael was just sitting there. It was just, I was my first trip to Mysore, and I saw him, and he was just breathing so effortlessly into his upper chest, and I I looked at it. And I thought, God damn, he's relaxed, and I'd never been I'd never been that relaxed, ever. Yeah. And then when I, yeah. and then I was, cause I was doing the patterning with Mitchell at the same time, I, I was recognizing the pattern of breath and in the movement in the chest. It was like, I've never moved my chest like that in my life. Yeah. But, but now it's just, it's just, it's so habitual, you know, 15, 20 years later, what is it? Oh no, it's 20 years later. <laughs> it's 20 years later, just to always be breathing here, moving here. And it, it, it does, it changes the it changes the, the vibration of the brain wave by doing mm-hmm. it. And then the personality, mm-hmm. of course, changes. Of course, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well that's that is the amazing thing too, even like just with the pranayama, right? It changes starts to change your nervous system. And so mm-hmm. you can kind of approach these um, just like the eight limbs of Ashtanga Yoga, right? Wherever you enter, it's going to affect all the other limbs. Mm-hmm. So you can you can enter through like a meditation technique and it's going to start to change your nervous system and your body and your breathing and your mind. Or you can enter through asana and start to change your body and that's going to change your ability to breathe and the way that you're thinking and feeling. Mm-hmm. And it's the same like, you know, whether it's through rolfing or... Um, pranayama or asana or you know meditation mm-hmm. it all like Absolutely. works together because of that mind body connection that we are talking about and, and the fact that they aren't different they're so intimately integrated that you can't affect Absolutely. one without affecting the other mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. speaking of which what, when I was reading through your bio, I was really kind of struck. I really felt like we were going to be talking to a much older woman. So you've really, <laughs> you've really done a lot, and you've been around. And I just to kind of tie, just to tie a bow on it. Um, you just, you just nearly died last year, and you're you're yeah. here on the show today yeah, that's to talk incredible. to us about your near death experience. We took us an hour and fifteen. <laughs> to get around to it but um how did everything just fall you seem so healthy how did everything just oh, fall you. for you what the hell happened oh you know yeah it's it's incredible i I've, i mean i've i don't even remember the last time i had to go to a doctor like i have gone to a naturopath because i had i felt like i had candida overgrowth you know but this is like the 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 sickest I've been, you know, yeah. thank God, knock on wood, I've been healthy all my life and uh, almost no problems, you know. And, um, you know, last year, uh, there were a lot of big life events that happened to me. Uh, and they were all one after another. Um, for example, I, um, I had to move uh, Shala and that was huge because I had to like move from my home and the studio into one space and then there was no break it was like we did the move for example on a Friday and Saturday morning I had led class you know and all Friday night with a bunch of students I was you know putting the (laughs) things into place and and uh and it was like just bam, 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 you know, and, and being independent, autonomous, not, not having a fixed salary, you know, the, the show must go on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> totally. it's, it's, that's how it goes. Yeah. And, um, and then at the same time, uh, I was finishing my advanced rolfing studies, and that meant going many weekends or weeks to Munich, traveling back and forth, and uh, then the it's expensive, it's, it's pricey. The, and then when I'm there studying, it means I'm not making money, I'm not rolfing or I'm not teaching. And um, 
and then there there was COVID time, and there's COVID time had its own stress. It means less students coming to the shala, people falling sick, so uh, barely doing workshops. Um, you know, it's just like this pressure for years, like accumulating through COVID. And um, I finished my advanced wolfing studies uh, around, I think, mid mid April or end of April. And uh, May, I had this uh, retreat, and uh, I, I taught this retreat. And I was saying, okay, I teach this retreat, and then I really, I'm really gonna take a break. I really need a break and just do nothing. I want to do nothing. And at the retreat, everyone was kind of like. Oh, I don't know how you do this. How do you have so much energy? And uh, well, it, was, it wasn't really a retreat. I call it like the intensive uh, weekend. I was teaching six hours uh, every day. You know, we would have afternoon classes and morning practice. And it was like, boom, 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 one after another. And everyone was saying, oh, you have so much energy. How can you do this all? And I was like, oh, I don't know, grace of God. <laughs> And four days after, I collapsed. I I was teaching my sore and I uh, showed a student, you know, how to extend from the chest in Ustrasana. And I came out of that and I had this kind of pain with, between my shoulder blades. And I thought, oh, you know, I shouldn't have demonstrated. I, I was stupid again. I, and I was like, mm. I was just like a... You know, ushtasana yeah. is nothing. You know, yeah. you know, it's not like an intense posture. Uh, but and then, and that sometimes happens. You know, something gets stuck in there. And I thought, okay, it'll be fine. And after the Mysore class, I asked one of the guys. I said, "Can you crack my back? I, I something stuck between my shoulder blades." And I, I'm not sure what it was. If it was cracking the back or if it was the demonstration. But I had a normal thorax, which is a collapsed lung and it happens to one in hundred thousand people a spontaneous normal thorax just out of nowhere <laughs> cool. wow and uh for four days i was breathing with one lung oh and I, so i was short of breath and i had yeah. so much pain in my whole right side the muscles were in spasm and I just thought I have a severe COVID. And I, I thought, okay, either I have a muscle spasm because I demonstrated something or I have COVID. I was sure I have COVID. And, um, and I was for four days at home until the result of a PCR test came out. And then I said, okay, I don't have COVID. So I went to the clinic and they did blood tests and they finally took a radiography. And then they said, madam, ah. You've been like this for four days and you walked here? Mm. I said, yeah. <laughs> oh you have God. one lung. <laughs> and they sent me immediately to uh, to the hospital. And they said that normally um, someone that this happens to them, within hours they have to go to the hospital. There's no way they can just stay at home <laughs> for four days and breathe. And... Um, and then there, you know, they, they, to get the air out of the layer of the pleura and lung, they put a thick tube in, through the ribs to suck the air out. And I was there for four days and then everything was okay. They sent me home. However, and then I was at home for, for one week and, you know, it has its consequences, but it's not too bad. I mean, I, I, Anyways, I wasn't supposed to move my arm or use my any do any asana or anything like that for a month at least until everything heals. However, after a week of uh, being home, I had to go for a checkup, and this is when things go wrong. And uh, the medical assistant, because there was no supervisor or um, they call it chef de cabinet, chef de clinique. Uh, present, the guy pulled my the thread of the stitch I had under my arm too early, and the hole just opened up. And so again, I had air going into my lung, and, and then I was again taken to emergency room. 
and put another tube in and the second tube oh in, it infected me oh. so yeah <laughs> that was just mm. surreal surreal and um so then and they didn't find out that i was infected uh like at least for a, until the week uh and Right, because then, then you probably just... started having like a fever and like feeling really, really, it's really bad. Infected yeah. on the inside. Yeah, yeah, I had, yeah, and I had so much pain um, in my in my back, thinking like I'm gonna lose my kidney. And I said, I have pain, I have pain, and they said, Oh, you need to like have be patient. Uh, it's normal. Uh, it's your diaphragm, and but no, like this is not this is not feeling right. And uh, then they started with really heavy antibiotics, but it wasn't working. And so all this time, also with tubes going through my ribs, sucking their air out to allow the lung to expand. Yeah. And the tubes are horrendously painful because they're quite thick and they go between the ribs. So I wasn't moving even a millimeter because every movement would hurt so much. Oh my gosh. Uh, so I was for three weeks on the bed and uh, and the lung wasn't recovering. And uh, so they finally surrender and say, okay, we don't know what to do. We, 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 I don't know what to do. The antibiotics are not working and can, your lung can just, cannot stay. Yeah. Can I just ask you, before we gloss over that, you can't mm. sleep or move for three mm. weeks. What do you actually, what do you do in that time for three weeks? How do you, what do you do if with you're your in the mind? Hospital, you're stuck in the hospital, right? What do you do with your mind yeah, though? Yeah. yeah. So I spent already one week, four days in the hospital. So then I came home. Then it was three weeks again at the hospital. Um, my mom flew over uh, immediately already hearing the first event yeah. And, you know, I had so much love around me. It, I, um, it was a very uh, tragic event, but it showed me so much beauty at the same time. Uh, um, my, my mom was almost all day uh, at the hospital, and uh, it's been a long time that I moved out of home and I wasn't close to my mom. I would see her you know, once a year for two weeks. And this event, you know, my mom was talking to me from her childhood in Iran to like storytelling, just keeping me busy. Wow. And uh, yeah, and I was just connecting with my mom and she was telling me uh, details of her life and past. And my ex-partner was coming every day. Students were coming every day. Uh, bringing flowers, bringing kitchery, bringing watermelon juice, like, <laughs> you know, just keeping me happy and, and love. And, wow. um, and also, uh, I was, I was scared. I, and, yeah. um, and since I make a living with my body, I didn't know what's going to happen in the future. So I was doing a lot of mantras, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, Keep, like uh, keep the fear away and have a faith and um i was putting like a lot of like chakra vibrations <laughs> like keeping the energy high it's doing just basically anything and and uh, it's incredible how the level of i don't know if, if it was prayer or what but i remember a student brought me a little ganesha and i was just staring at this ganesha mm -hmm. and and praying and like chanting to ganesha like move the obstacle away and um wow. you know and like you're just calling to the whole universe and and really uh thinking of oh my god if i have the chance to live again to teach again to practice again how is it gonna be mm. and um all kind of negativity uh, jealousy towards people uh feeling uh, i don't know problems that existed before all of them went away uh, mm. it was just like oh no i just want to live again i want to do well i want to love i want to 
uh, do good in this world before I before I die. I mean, that's I did live by these principles before, but it just it just goes to another level because you kind of think this this is it. Like I'm going to be crippled or I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So no oh more no more Ashtanga, no more role thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's also the, still the this is the inevitable for all of us. You're just kind of experiencing it er, early. But that's yeah. life changing, like you say. Yeah. It it really reframes things. Yeah, and I think uh, being a dancer, then moving on to being a rolfer and and uh, ashtanga teacher. Uh, there's so much identity built through physical performance and physical ability. They're all related to how able you are physically. Yeah. And I was like, wow, wow, like who am I or what am I going to be if I can't (laughs) perform at any of these, um, uh, what do you say, jobs or or roles? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what am I? Yeah, yeah. What are you I'm, without I'm your server? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who? Yeah, who? <laughs> who? Just God. That's all yeah. that's left. So then yeah. someone came and saved your life. <laughs> yeah, miracle. <laughs> There's a very famous uh, professor, doctor, um, because Lausanne has a university uh, uh, hospital. And there's a professor who does um, uh, lung transplant uh, um, with less uh, interview. Oh, I forgot the proper name for it, but less intervention. Less intervening, less yeah. intervention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they transferred me to that hospital, he kept me uh, that night, and he immediately operated me the day after. He washed my lung. He said he'll do what he can. There's a chance that it won't work, but am I willing to give it a try? And I said, yeah, I mean, you're my last hope. And he oh my washed my lung. Uh, and I had. they said, we're going to do a bulectomy uh, operation on you. And I, I Googled, I was like, what's bulectomy? What's a bula? <laughs> it showed yeah. like, <laughs> and it showed that they would, you know, cut through, like a huge scar on the side to get into the lung. And I was so scared, but he did with less intervention, which was sending his cameras in already with the holes that I had with the tubes, making them a little bit larger. Um, And so he sent his cameras that uh, cut, uh, cut, stitch, you know, everything at the same time. And he washed the lung he scraped off a layer of my lung and he uh, stuck it. So when they scrape it off, it kind of creates inflammation. So it gets, uh, it sticks itself to the pleura. So that makes sure that the lung will not collapse again. And he also had to cut off uh, three centimeters of my higher lobe of, on the right side. And the machine uh, cuts and sews at the same time. So it's, I mean, it's incredible what they, what they can wow. do now. I don't know if this yeah. would have been possible a decade ago. And, um, and it worked. I was, uh, after the operation, I was still in the hospital three, four days under the machines and the air sucking the tubes going into the lung and sucking the air out. But then, uh, thank God I, I recovered. I mean, I, uh, I got out and I still had a lot of pain for some months, but I didn't have a collapsed lung and uh, the infection went away. I had to continue with antibiotics for another whole month, yeah. but it, it worked. Mm. I've, I've heard incredible. of this before. I, I have a, in Chicago, I, I knew a couple, like it was the kind of thing that happens to young men, young skinny exactly. men. Young skinny yeah. athlete, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but like... Very Just uncommon out of the blue. women. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God. Wow. Yeah. You seem fine. <laughs> oh, that, was all, so. <laughs> that was all last year. So it's uh, been yeah, almost, almost a year. A year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I have uh, three holes under my armpit and back and a lot of scar tissue. Wow. And my higher um, right ribs 
relationship to sternum they get stuck so there are certain postures that i can't do like uh, twists or hard or leg mm. behind the head on the right side because to collapse mm. the chest in and become yeah. kyphotic it, it's painful on my lung and the ribs but i mean who cares <laughs> Nobody yeah, we are alive. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like I don't care. <laughs> Not important. Yeah, yeah. So how yeah. did it? How did it change your your approach to life? Like, how did you even get back into practice or teaching or being active again? Yeah, you know, before uh, this happened, I was a little bit, you know, geeky with like. I was you're so keen to like improve fourth series and like right. complete fourth series. <laughs> yeah. And and every day that I couldn't have a proper practice and you know explore my fourth series, it was like, oh today I didn't like do it and I didn't give right. it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of being disappointed. I'm like, I'm not working hard enough. I need to change my lifestyle even more to be ta able to tackle that. And then uh, after this, uh, and, and I was working really hard, you know, being demanding with myself, like I'm saying, yeah. fourth series while having a, uh, a shala, job, and, and a know, job, a shala, wrapping, a you're using your body, all the things, yeah. Yeah. And uh, wanting to, you know, finish my advanced studies by a certain date and all that, being being quite demanding. And after that, I really learned to slow down and take things much lightly and uh, definitely work less, give less importance to things. So, so uh, some stuff at the Shala you, used to bother me a lot, you know, the stuff the students do and why were they talking? <laughs> like, yeah. right? Why did All they leave the, the teacups? In, yeah. <laughs> why did they leave the teacups why out? <laughs> So now it's like, okay, I said it enough times, like, <laughs> or, you know, just not letting things get, get into me or bother me. Um, they, it's just not important. <laughs> and um, uh, definitely cherishing life way more, just the simplest things. Oh my God, getting up and breathing, the fear yeah. of not not being able to breathe was uh, devastating and you know i wasn't going to the bathroom i couldn't sleep for a long time coming off morphine um yeah. i couldn't even lie down when i would lie down the pressure would build up on oh my, my chest so i yeah. was inclined for months uh and i missed so much lying down or sleeping on my side i'm a slight side sleeper um you know just like the simplest simplest things uh were not possible and i mean you're a wreck if you can't sleep uh eat uh breathe <laughs> and, breathe and yeah. maybe yeah <laughs> and maybe not doing your asana practice that you're so used to right yeah. um i used to be able to walk to get my my shirts pressed and i have <laughs> to drive now it's really inconvenient <laughs> so i really I feel, I really feel you. It's really hard Aww. to have something yeah. taken from you like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've also become more compassionate, I have to say. Really understanding what it means to have a lot of pain or be sick. Because it's yeah. hard to imagine if you've never been that low in your life or bedridden yeah. or have a lot of pain in your body. It's, it's hard to imagine what another person who's incapable of doing things could feel like yeah. yeah 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 that's such a good point i think that's we think we understand people's experience or their bodies or what's going on for them and i think as a, a yoga teacher often we take that approach like well i know best because i'm the teacher mm -hmm. And, you know, mm. I, you're just not working hard enough or however we're talking to ourselves in mm -hmm. our head is yeah. often how we're projecting that onto the students as mm -hmm. well. And, mm. and then when something like this happens, all of a sudden you realize like, oh, actually <laughs> that whole dialogue in my head was part of the mm -hmm. problem, like driving me, pushing me, like, 
I'm not working hard enough. I'm not doing, you know, and you have so much more self-compassion and then that self-compassion naturally uh, yeah. translates outward into compassion for others, like true compassion for others, not just like, oh, Absolutely. you're not really working hard enough, but I'll be nice to you kind of <laughs> compassion. Right. But, yeah. but like, <laughs> but, yeah. it's actually contempt, not compassion. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but like, really, yeah. like, how can we make this easier for you? How can I serve you? How can I support you? And it does change how you teach as a teacher and who you are inside. Yeah. yeah. Because all Absolutely. of a sudden, you have self-compassion and self-love that isn't about berating yourself or driving yourself into the ground or, you know, like needing to mm -hmm. be the best or whatever that is, that's, that is the pattern. And, and it, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. unfortunately it takes these types of, of crises and experiences. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. To sometimes really integrate a more compassionate pattern to yourself, you know, or more yeah. understanding about what suffering is. Yeah, mm. what suffering is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so it's beautiful. And I'm glad you're alive. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you look all right. Yeah. Mm. But let's yeah. let's shift for a moment before we close, because we met not through Arvin, but through mm. um B school where you were yeah, like yes. starting to create your yoga shala and you came into my B school mastermind group and there were so many beautiful humans and you, yoga teachers you didn't meet and coaches like doing in there. Yoga no, we met online. Oh. School, we've never yeah. met doing yoga. We've only met building yoga schools. I'm <laughs> very surprised yeah. to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So what was that experience like for you? Where were you before you kind of like when you were thinking, oh, should I do this? What was going through your head and why did you decide yeah. to jump in and do it? Mm, so I was, I already had a yoga shala, but I was very lucky. My first yoga shala in Switzerland, I got very lucky with this heritage building that uh, wasn't giving me a long-term contract because uh, they were making only short contract, but it was a friendly price, which yeah. was a great way to start teaching totally. because you have less students and you have, yeah, I, I was new. I was, I had just come to Switzerland. Uh, however, uh they told me that they're not going to renew the contract and they were going to demolish the building and that i have um and they weren't giving an exact date either they were like right. a year six months you gotta leave and find something else and we were in the middle of covid also which was so uncertain you were like oh yeah. like what am I what yeah. am I gonna rent? What if we close down again and and or there are all these weird rules that you can have five, ten students and and um my my yoga shala was running with the rent I was paying. However, when I started looking at rents at that moment, it was just triple the price for something similar. And uh not just the rent and then it was maybe just a piece of, you know, uh, the apartment where you had to build a shower and, uh, right. you know, turn it into a yoga studio because maybe it was a hair salon, you know, and it was just over, over my budget and imagination to be able to pay that and run a yoga shala. And so I, I was following you, of course. And, uh, then I was like, Oh, what's this B school she's talking about? <laughs> And uh, I, I saw some of Marie's uh, things, Mary, uh, Mary's, yeah. um, I forgot her last name, Forleo. Mary Forleo. Forleo. Yeah. Forleo, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, videos, and it seems so interesting. And I believed in it. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to do this. I mean, what's what am I going to lose? And uh, I actually did it twice with you because the first time I didn't get to uh, attend your tutorial, all the tutorials right. and do all the homework. But even doing some of the homework, some of the first stages, yeah, uh, which was, you know, filling the sheets about, well, how do you imagine uh, your business or whatever yeah. service you're offering and how much, uh, what type of clients do you wish to have? 
and uh, what budget do you need for this to run? It all felt uh, a bit like um, a little too good to be true, or I don't know, that's not the right word. Like, like imagining out of mad too much imagination out of yeah. my reach. Just the question of what kind of clients or people do you want to work with? I was like, well, yeah. What kind of students do I wish to have? <laughs> And I and I and I describe them. I describe I want dedicated, respectful, uh, regular students. You know, enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you know, kind of like it's like yeah. What what kind of people do I feel like working with? And I swear to you, this is what I have right now. This is yeah. the type of people that walk into my shallow. Right now. And. Um, and I and then there was this question: How much do you need to be able to make it? So I calculated an estimate of what a studio would cost me, and then the insurance and the electricity and this and that. And when I calculated it, it was uh, it came to twelve thousand. Oh my god! Whoa! <laughs> I need to make twelve thousand just to make it even. Yeah, and it just felt you know too good. It's just too too, too much. much. I was like, yeah. well, I'm just, yeah, I'm just gonna put it down because the exercise asks me to put it down. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so then I just took the steps. You know, it just yeah. takes you step by step. You do this. Don't yeah. don't um, stop the limiting thoughts. Just do the homework. And, yeah, you know about what what do you need? What do you want? What do you offer? be clear about yeah, yeah. the service you like to offer and how does it make uh, how does it change people's lives and how are others going to benefit from it and um and i uh i, I did find this uh, finally this space where i'm at now and again it seemed just way up over my head you know yeah. it, it felt like a joke it was like no way i, I can't mm -hmm. rent this and um, I had only a few months to decide uh, uh, to, to find the space because the contract at the other shala was en uh, ending. And I remember I was uh, practicing with Christina Caritino in Crete. Oh. And I came down. Yeah, and I, I was in uh, Viparita Shala Vasana. And I came down and I said to myself, you know what? <laughs> if I can do this damn posture, I can exactly. make this work. Like <laughs> exactly, amazing. I was it's em empowered posture. somehow. Yeah, yeah. I was empowered. I came down. I was like, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> and I told the guy that um, I wrote him an email. I said, Okay, I'll, I'll take the apartment. And uh, and you know, people around me were like, Okay, well. You you'll see, you know, mm. you see what you're getting yourself into. There's still COVID and there's, oh my there's a third wave coming. <laughs> right. And I said, no, no, this is, this is, this is going to work. Don't worry. I'll, I got this. And I guess because we put the intention out there, the universe hears us and mm. came flowing the students. Um, everything I had uh, set on that homework how many retreats do I need to get this going? How many workshops? How many classes do we need? I had to offer afternoon classes mm -hmm. and not Mysore because less people start Mysore. And I started yeah. offering half primary guided classes, you know, doing what yeah. I could to get this going. And now we're making way above, you know, that um, estimate to, to make even Whoa. to get the shala mm -hmm. going. And uh, it's, you know, we do talk about, you know, the, the law of vibration and blah, yeah. blah, blah. But to really do the work and to set the intentions and to be clear about what we want, I think this is what B-School offers. Yeah. Take the necessary steps, small steps, just yeah. like Ashtanga, you know, the vinyasa, the, the karma, like yeah. step by step, just do the work and then boom. Um, you're in something big happens you're in fourth <laughs> yeah. yeah just like that it's amazing it's so incredible and the fact that you did all of this too and then had like this massive emergency and mm -hmm. 
but also had a community that was there to support you and hold this space for you. And it's just so beautiful what you created yeah. and built Thanks. and that it's, it's flourishing and growing. Yeah. It's, and it's beautiful. They're like really a family and that's what I wanted. I also wrote in the, on the sheet that, you know, I don't want just customers like yoga customers coming in and out of here. I want, I want a community. I want a loving community people sharing the same path and supporting each other on on our path and that's how they are this is they're, they're people who come to the shala really are so loving such respectful beings uh dedicated i mean they're all doing their best uh, yeah. you know they might not practice four or five times a week but they're they're yeah. there you know they show yeah. up yeah and uh it's amazing. Well, well, here's what I want to do. I want to um, organize a workshop with you. I want to come <laughs> this year, He's next year is setting fine. Setting his intention. And I'm going to set up this intention. I want to. I want to uh, arrive in in Switzerland. I'm gonna. We're gonna get something like, not champagne, but like prosecco, and it's like something cheaper, <laughs> like but like twenty bottles of it. And spin around the room. No, we, we're gonna we're gonna drink pretty hard, but we're gonna lie down on our yoga mats until I get each of your students to experience ecstasy, oh and I'm gonna God. walk them through how how to how how to you don't shy away from the spins, but like go into go, it. go into the spin, and I'd like to do that maybe like around Christmas. Christmas. Sure, you're both more than welcome. It would be an <laughs> honor to have you here in Switzerland. Really. That'd be amazing. We're going to make this happen, and he's all of a sudden going to believe in the manifestation powers of no, the individual really, the universe. I'm thinking of like yeah. pink champagne, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> Mm. pink champagne on we'll ice. get pink champagne <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever you wish uh well awesome. i think your students are so yeah. lucky lucky to have you and i'm sure oh, the you. community there is just blessed beyond measure so. i i just i couldn't believe it when harmony handed me this and i read through <laughs> i didn't know you and you know there's you, you think you're going to you're going to hear about fourth series of Shtanga yoga practitioners, given that, you know, we're part of the community. But this is really <laughs> an amazing, amazing life story. And you're not even half done. And it's incredible. You're like a third, maybe like a third of the way. And it's incredible. Really amazing oh, well, to meet you. Yeah, let's see. Thank you. Same. I mean, I've known both of you for a while and I've been following you and listening to your podcast and looking at Harmony's videos, dissecting her coordination oh, and gosh. movement <laughs> and, <laughs> and during COVID taking so many of her courses. So, and this is like a real pleasure and honor to be able to have this time with both of you, really. The yeah. honor is ours. Thank you. Yeah. It is. Thank you Aww. so much. And I look forward to seeing you in person one day soon. Christmas. <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully yeah. next time you're in Europe. Yes, I think Christmas yes. is a Zoroastrian holiday. We'll so, plan for yeah. 2024. The... Yeah, let's make it, <laughs> make it over a Zoroastrian holiday. I wish we should do that. That'd be good. Yes. Yeah, Please beautiful. come. <laughs> I'll organize, I'll organize something for you. It would be, you will bring a lot of light to our shala. That would be a blessing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Finding Harmony. With me, your host, Harmony Slater. You can find out more information on my website, harmonyslater.com. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Standing in eternity's shadow, watching the breaking waves, there's a heart.